Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Just a note on the current series that we're running this week. Um, there's often quite a lot of negative news in today's world that can make um, positive change feel like a very daunting task. So whether it's the state of global affairs or climate change or plastic pollution, so we feel that it's really important to showcase some of the organizations that are doing really impactful work for positive change. So on that note, um, we're very grateful to have with us today Heidi Tate from Tangaroa Blue in Australia. Uh, Heidi was named one of the most influential women in ocean conservation in 2018, so we're very grateful to have her with us here today. Uh, Heidi, I'm going to hand over to you whenever you're ready. Excellent. Thank you so much, and it's wonderful to join you. Um, love the opportunity to speak and share knowledge and stories across the world. So um, hopefully I will be uh, providing some positiveness and some case studies. And of course, I'm absolutely happy to, um, to share more or answer any questions that you, that you have. I am just going to pull some slides over to a different screen and share my screen. So if you are able just to let me know that you can see that okay, give me a thumbs up. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll start off. So my name's Heidi Tate and I'm the CEO and the founder of the organization that's called uh, Tangaroa Blue Foundation. And a lot of people always ask me what Tangaroa means. Um, it's actually the Polynesian and the Maori God of the Ocean. And one of his laws are, if you look after me, I look after you. And that's the basis of our entire programs that, that we're running, is trying to look after the environment that we actually all take a fair bit um, from. So um, I'll just get these slides. So I'd like to start off by giving an acknowledgement of country. And it's something that we do in Australia. Um, and Tangaroa Blue Foundation acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land and the sea country on which we live and we work. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their continuous relationship to this land and the ongoing cultures of the Aboriginal and the Torres Strait Island peoples across Australia. Um, so I'd just like to share that with you to start off with. So Tangaroa Blue Foundation has been coordinating a program called the Australian Marine Debris Initiative um, since 2004 when I started the program. And basically it's a nationwide program that focuses not only on the removal of marine debris, but of citizen science collected data um, to document what we're finding, which is then used to try and prevent marine debris and plastic pollution. And we've been working on this for nearly two decades. Uh, and back when we first started, uh, people actually thought that I was talking about driftwood when I was talking about marine debris. So there wasn't a lot of focus on, on this issue. Um, but today we know that, uh, you know, a lot of people know that there's plastics in our oceans. Um, and we have a lot more people jumping into this space, whether it is um, for the good, or we've now seen marketing brands that are claiming um, to make products out of 100% ocean plastic. Um, and the marine debris space has definitely changed in those two decades. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm the founder and the CEO, and I'd like to talk about the, um, the growth of the Australian Marine Debris Initiative and how citizen science has actually helped guide policy change and the challenges that we have in meeting the United Nations Global Treaty on Plastic Pollution by 2024, which is obviously the big news in this space um, in the last 12 months. So as I mentioned, Tangaroa is the god of the ocean, and he has a law that if you look after me, I'll look after you. So we think that that's a pretty good philosophy to follow, considering how vital the ocean ecosystem is to the health of, of the planet. And the Australian Marine Debris Initiative, which is our main focus, our main program, um, has these following components. And we believe that if we're going to actually find a solution to marine debris, we need to be doing all of these things. We can't just focus, obviously, on cleaning up all the time. And we can't just follow, um, you know, uh, focus on policy um, change. We, we need to have a lot of different components working together. So the AMD is or what we call the AMD for short, is uh, starting off with doing catchment cleanups. Uh, and they can be cleanups not only on our beaches, um, but also estuaries, um, stormwater drains, underwater, offshore islands, they all are part of the story. Um, we have our volunteers then separate and sort the debris into um, set out categories. And we then collect that data that gets inputted into our database. 
Uh, we use that data to try and track back to the source wherever we can. Um, and then we use it to implement what we call source reduction plans that aim to really attack or tackle one particular item that's found at a particular location. And if we can find a really good solution to that, um, then we have a way to scale that into other areas. But the only way that we're going to know if we're having an impact or not is continuing to do these cleanups and the data collection, because that enables us to really, really measure the impact. And so all of those components fit together and they help to guide policy, change, education, awareness, industry best practice, and, and so forth. So I know that there's probably people on here that are very well aware of um, this issue. So I'm not gonna go and talk about the, the basics, but I did wanna just mention that back in 2004, when we started, the United Nations had estimated um, around 6 million metric tons of marine debris that was impacting in our oceans or entering our oceans every year. Now, recently, the United Nations Environment Program has estimated that we're up around the 11 million metric tons. So just wanted to show how quickly this has increased from six to almost doubling. And then, of course, we've got um, potential for it to triple in the next 20 years, which is just scary. Um, and we also know that plastics are the largest part of what we're finding in our marine environment. And again, just to see this increase is that when we first started, we were looking at in Australia, a national average of about 75% plastic from all our cleanups. And now we're seeing this is up towards the 85%. So that plastic is increasing in its um, percentage of our marine debris makeup or our marine debris signature. So those are really concerning. And we know that, you know, primarily when the marine debris issue was really being um, introduced, I guess, into, into the sphere, um, that conservation values were the ones that were driving the investment from governments and from grants. So it was this ingestion and this um, entanglement issue from our wildlife that was really, really pushing it. But we know that that resulted in very minimal amount of impact, not only from a funding perspective, but also from a policy setting. Um, and so now we've really been trying to highlight those other impacts that um, marine debris has. And so we know that we have damage to uh, vessels in navigation. We know that we have um, tourism impacts where people don't want to go and swim in plastic bags on their holiday. We know that we also have potential human impacts um, because we eat fish and we know that science hasn't caught up to what that actually means but when we have plastics that have endocrine, uh, um, oh, I can't even say that word now, <laughs> endo disrupting chemicals in them, um, we know that that's not good if it impacts uh, our food chain, uh, particularly because we're at the, at the top of it. So looking at these different impacts is where we're seeing um, further investment and, and policy change happening. Now, one of the things that we want to educate the community around why plastic is so bad in, in the environment um, is because it actually never goes away. And we used to see um, a lot of, um, I guess, uh, the way people described plastic when it starts to fragment and degrade was that it, it broke down. And when we looked at that kind of concept or that terminology, um, we really thought that people um, eventually thought that it just goes away, that just because you couldn't see it anymore, that it had miraculously disappeared. So even in the way that we're um, using terminology, we're trying to educate and aware. And we always say that plastic breaks up because it actually becomes a bigger issue when we start to see smaller and smaller pieces of plastic in the environment. It might take us a second to bend down and pick up a plastic water bottle that might be on a beach. But if that water bottle was in a thousand small pieces, obviously investment in time and energy to remove that is, is much greater. So the problem is, is more and more um, a problem. And of course, you know, a wider variety of um, wildlife can uh, be impacted once it's, it's small. When we started to look at tracking to the source, we, you know, we understood that there was a real wide variety of sources that marine debris can come from. So we have from the land and from the sea, you know, litter, stormwater drains, sewage systems, wind, visitors to the beach, running off from factories or dumping. And from the sea, we've got recreational um, or commercial fishing, cargo ships and ocean currents. But the challenge that we really discovered is that there's different jurisdictions. And so some of these are local government responsibilities. Some of them are state 
government responsibilities and some of them are either federal or international responsibilities. And that's where I think we started to see some of the complexities around solving this issue. Uh, we also saw a lot of gaps where nobody was doing anything. And we also saw a lot of duplication where too many people were trying to fix something and there was no coordination as well. So that's been a real ch challenge is this um, different jurisdictions that we're, that we're finding. And of course, let's throw another issue on top of all that, which is um, these extreme weather events that are starting to, to see more and more of. And in Australia this year, we've had some massive flooding. Um, this is obviously the um, results of a flood where we had two months worth of landfill um, washing up in three days. Um, so this is a, a really big concern when we know that these type of events are going to become more and more and more occurring and maybe in places that haven't really seen this type of damage before. So when we looked at the data from the Australian Marine Debris Initiative database, one of the first things that we discovered within Australia is that we didn't just have one thing that was the problem. Regionally, the marine debris data signature was very, very different. And I want to take you around a quick trip around Australia here. So in the, the top left hand corner here, we see these two guys who, um, who found probably the luckiest thing that's ever been found on a beach cleanup, which is a $50 note. Um, two school kids, they were pretty stoked with that. Uh, so that, that was one thing. The, the middle one up the top there, these are three balloons that were tracked back to a festival um, and had travelled from an inland suburb near Sydney across into the ocean and then 600 kilometres just in over seven days. Um, and they were still washed up with air on a, a remote beach out on Lord Howe Island. So these, um, these balloons, totally different issue. Uh, the top right hand corner is one of our staff members in one of our very remote cleanup events and um, this particular event we do with the Indigenous Rangers, we actually removed um, over uh, 10,000 drink bottles from this one beach from seven kilometres of beach. Now what was amazing was that only 20 of these drink bottles actually had an Australian brand on them, the rest were either unidentifiable um, or they were from offshore sources and international sources. Um, so this is a, a really big struggle for this community. They have very little litter, but they have a massive amount of ocean-borne marine debris. Um, down there in the, the bottom uh, left-hand corner is uh, a crew doing um, a cleanup at a, a very popular Australian beach called Bondi Beach. You guys may have been there if you've ever been to Sydney. Uh, 25,000 cigarette butts collected in a couple of months during their weekly cleanups. Now, what's amazing with this is Bondi Beach actually has um, a local law that says you can't smoke on the beach. So clearly that law isn't working um, and that's because it's not being enforced. So no point having local laws unless you're going to put the effort in to enforcement behind them. Uh, the middle one at the bottom here, this is a massive amount of cotton bud sticks or cotton tips, I think they call them, um, which they found at a beach near Victoria. Uh, and what we've discovered is these are actually going through the sewerage system um, and the waste treatment plants. And it's because people flush them down the toilet and the, um, the filters there aren't fine enough to actually collect these cotton bud sticks. So again, you're starting to see the real difference in the issues or the sources of marine debris that we're finding. And so, you know, not just one, one um, solution. And the last one, which looks like snow is polystyrene um, washed up on Christmas Island. And, uh, and they have a lot of um, polystyrene boys and packaging that wash up and the cliffs there are so, um, sharp that it actually works like a bit of a cheese grater and creates this, this polystyrene um, snow washing up on the beach. So each one of those would need a specific strategy to address it at the source and identifying which jurisdiction it is and then which stakeholder group that you need to find that solution can sometimes be pretty complex and, um, and the hardest thing in addressing the issue in the first place. But if all we do is clean up, that's all we'll ever do. So we do need to find these um, alliances, these collaborations and these strategies that, that really do start turning off the tap and stopping um, marine debris from entering the environment in the first place. So let's focus on some good news stories of how this has happened. And we're gonna look at some source production projects, which are the key to identifying what actually is the change that is needed. 
So this is our uh, remote beach up in, in Cape York or one of the, the remote beaches up there. There's about 800 kilometres of coastline, uh, very, very few communities up there. But as you can see, highly impacted by marine debris. And uh, a lot of that is international. Well, the majority of that over 95% is, is international source debris um, and a significant amount, obviously, from the commercial uh, fishing industry. So one of the things that we actually do when we record um, debris to identify the source is we record barcodes and brands so we can actually get an idea of what influences uh, are occurring within the data set. Um, and I wanted to share with you a good news story. So this is the first one. Um, obviously by doing so many cleanups in Cape York we actually know what type of brands are normal, what we're seeing regularly. And during one of our Indigenous led um, community cleanups in Cape York, we came across a water bottle brand from Vietnam that we'd never actually ever seen before. Um, and you can see from the cleanliness and the uh, condition of these bottles that they haven't floated from Vietnam. They're all very, very new. They still have their labels on them. And in fact, the expiry date still had 12 months to go on them. So they, they came from a close source. Now, one of our partners within the Australian Marine Debris Initiative is the Australian Gov Government's um, Department of Agriculture. And quite often they will come along to our cleanups. They're responsible for ensuring that we don't get um, pests and diseases coming from other countries onto the coastline. So they really love coming along to these cleanups because it does give them an opportunity to see what kind of things are washing up in different areas and if there may be a risk there. Uh, so we, we let the, the officer know that, you know, this was a very unusual brand and that we found actually 300 of these on this beach cleanup. And she was able to report that back through her chain of command. And about a week later, we got a, a, a phone call from Border Force who are responsible in Australia for um, customs and, and for immigration. And they asked us some more information about this particular water bottle brand and where we'd found it. And they were able to plug that into some ocean modeling. And they actually sent uh, a Border Force vessel out into the middle of the Coral Sea with this data. And they were able to apprehend an illegal fishing fleet from Vietnam. So we were actually able to find um, uh, an illegal fishing uh, fleet based on debris that was washing up and understanding the value of collecting really detailed data to help identify that source. So that was, that was quite a, a unique story. The volunteers involved in that were all pretty excited. Uh, the first source reduction project that we actually tried to tackle back in 2004 were these um, packing tape um, that go around boxes. And we were able to identify that um, particular colours and widths of packing tape were used from the rock lobster industry in Western Australia. Uh, and by working with the industry and with the Department of Fisheries, we were able to get legislation actually changed. So now it's illegal to have these packing tapes on boxes when they go out on fishing vessels. Um, and so the legislation requires them to be taken off the boxes and disposed of on shore uh, before the boxes go or the vessel goes out to sea. Um, and you can see there that we were getting quite a lot back in the 2005 to 2008 you know, period. Um, and in 2011 was when that legislation was changed and we have seen a significant decrease in that particular item since then. So again, really good detailed data consistently collected has been able to change legislation. And what's so exciting about this is it's citizen science data. So we have such an important um, role to play in, um, in providing data that may not be collected otherwise because it's expensive um, to do that from a government or a university setting. Um, this is one of our, our partners that we work with and um, single use water bottles are obviously a, a really massive um, issue within our data sets as well and our litter that we're seeing. Um, and we worked with uh, a company called We Refill to provide these uh, We Refill um, water stations at one of Australia's biggest music festivals called Blues Fest. Um, and in 2019, prior to COVID, um, we actually were able to install 18 of these water refill stations one on each of the stages um, at the music festival. So none of the artists or the back of house crew had to use water bottles. They were all given these reusable bottles that were refillable. And in a, in a result of 48,000 plastic water bottle reduction just from that one music festival. So what was exciting about this was that it was obviously a collaboration between the festival and one of our um, corporate partners to find a solution to single-use water bottles. Um, and everybody had to do something slightly different. 
but it resulted in such a massive reduction um, that it really has set the bar as far as uh, single-use plastics and, and reducing them within the settings like music festivals. And we had our friend Jack Johnson, the musician, who came along and helped promote this through the, um, the BYO bottle movement as well. Now we know that the number one um, litter item that we find um, within our data sets is cigarette butts and um, Australia is not unusual for that. We know that that is similar across the whole world. So we wanted to try and find a cigarette butt source reduction project. Um, and we developed a program called Ditch the Flick. So the action of flicking the cigarette butt is when that item actually becomes litter. And so that's what we need to try and address. So we did that with um, the Country Bank Stadium in Townsville, which is where all our rugby league games uh, are played in far north Queensland. Uh, and we wanted to see if during the NRL season in 2021, we could reduce cigarette butt um, litter. Now, what's interesting about the stadium is it backs onto the Ross Creek, which goes directly out into the Great Barrier Reef. So it was a really good connection to a program that we're running along the Great Barrier Reef called Reef Claim. And one of the first things that we did was we went to one of the games and we walked around outside the stadium because you can't smoke inside the stadium. So everyone has to come out. And we asked people there if they knew where someone could have a cigarette. And what we discovered was that people thought you could smoke anywhere you wanted because there wasn't any designated areas that they were aware of. So that was the first thing that we wanted to address with the stadium. We also wanted to make sure that cigarette butt bins were really easy to identify. And so we made them look like cigarette butts. And we wanted to make sure people knew where to find the designated smoking areas. So we used a whole heap of um, directional signage. Uh, so it made it very, very easy um, for people to find where they can go and have a cigarette. And within the first five games of the NRL season, we were able to reduce cigarette butts litter by 71%, which is just such a massive outcome. But again, the key here was around collaboration. We really needed the stadium to be on board with this. We had uh, a team of volunteers that you can see there in their high vis, which we called our Litter Hero team. And they were there helping people understand where the designated smoking areas were. Um, and this program has now been adopted by the stadium and is now running through its second year now. Um, and we're seeing, you know, continued really, really good results um, through that, that program. But it gives you a, a case study that then can be replicated. And uh, the company that, or the, the government who owns um, the stadium here actually owns stadiums all across uh, Queensland. So they're taking what we were able to do in Townsville and work that um, as a case study that they can then roll out in all their other stadiums as well, because now they, they know exactly how they need to do that. Uh, one of our newest programs is called Rig Recycle, and we are looking to recycle items that would normally go to landfill, uh, including um, spools, old fishing line, and other kinds of recreational fishing items. So this program isn't one of those um, bins that you would normally put at a fishing spot where you would put used um, dirty gear that you might pick up. This is actually in store um, and we're working with a number of tackle stores to host these rig recycle bins. So people, not only people that are consumers can bring back their old gear, but what we've discovered is the majority of the items that are getting put in these bins are actually from the store themselves. So the fishing line spools, um, all the packaging that's in store, and we've been able to find ways to work with our um, plastics industry partners to um, recycle these items, all of which would, would normally go to landfill. And we're so excited that we've been able to roll this out in two states now, in Queensland and New South Wales. And we're hoping to roll it out in our third state um, along the East Coast in Victoria uh, later on today, uh, later on this year. Um, sticking to the fishing thing, um, we also have identified lots of these glow sticks, uh, chemical light sticks um, during some of our cleanup events or in particular items. And so we've, we've worked with Ocean Watch Australia, um, who are a, um, another charity who work with the commercial fishing industry to find a solution to that. And what was really um, inspiring about this was that we created a, a, a reusable glow stick or light stick library. Um, and we needed uh, a couple of fishermen to um, trial the library. So they could take these, uh, these reusable light sticks 
uh, for free. They could go out and do several fishing trips with them to see whether it actually impacted their catch or not. Um, and we were so lucky to have this um, fisherman from K uh, TK Offshore Fishing actually go and post on his, his own social media page about how amazing these um, reusables were and that he was going to give them a go. And, you know, it's all good and well for a, an NGO or a charity to talk about reducing plastics. But if you want somebody within an industry to do it, you really need an industry champion. Um, and so we're looking at, at continuing transitioning some of these chemical um, light sticks into reusables through the commercial um, fishing industry now that we have a bit of a case study there as well. Keeping on an industry theme, um, I know that uh, you guys have Operation Clean Sweep in, in um, certain countries. Um, not every country has Operation Clean Sweep. It's a plastics industry uh, program that looks at reducing plastic resin pellets and myrtles. Uh, I know that you guys had that massive spill um, a couple of years ago now. Uh, we were waiting to actually see whether those uh, plastic resin pellets would wash up on the west coast of Australia, um, but we didn't see them in la the large numbers that we were fearing. Not quite sure where they all ended up, and I, I believe it, quite a lot did get cleaned up. But this is an industry program of the most basic housekeeping on trying to have um, resin pellets or other kind of feedstocks as well. Um, captured or contained within operations, uh, whether that's transportation, supply, manufacturing, and now even recycling. So uh, when we look at Operation Clean Sweep, it was developed in the US by the chemical industry over there. And in Australia, um, we have a partnership with Chemistry Australia to roll this program out in Australia. The, um, it's the, actually the only country in the world that has an NGO part of this, this program or running the, the program from the conservation sector. And it's been a very unique, um, a new, a unique partnership, I guess. So we've been kind of slow to get this up and running, um, but we are starting to get a bit of momentum. And the reason that we're starting to get momentum isn't just because we have an industry program and we have the industry starting to look at it, but we're now starting to see some compliance happening in Australia. And recently we had a national plastics plan that was released. Um, and within that, it actually had a target for Operation Clean Sweep to be rolled out. So we're starting to see some interest from the government in this as well, which is exciting. Um, one of the issues that we uh, discovered with the loss of plastic feedstock from the industry is that there was no compliance. Quite often local government considered it an EPA issue because it was industrial. The EPA thought it was a local government issue. Uh, and so there's one of those gaps there that we talked about with jurisdiction. Nobody was really addressing it. And I wanted just to um, highlight what that legislative change is in Victoria, because this is exciting. And we are hoping that other jurisdictions or compliance agencies around the world look at this. Now, normally the EPA, the Environmental Protection Authority, would go and visit a company or a business if there had been a spill or a pollution incident, and there would be um, a prosecution based on that spill. Well, this new legislation is changing the entire focus of the EPA from um, a compliance measure after the event to prevention. And the framework is now based on something called a general environmental duty. So basically it's an obligation for all businesses and individuals to proactively minimize the risk of harm to human health and the environment from their activities so far as reasonably practical, practicable. So businesses will need to demonstrate that they've actually assessed their risks effectively and acted to reduce them appropriately. Now, that is all based on another term, which is called state of knowledge. And so if everybody within an, a particular industry knows uh, certain risks are there and there were certain mitigation strategies in place that would prevent those risks, and one particular business wasn't doing those, then the EPA could hold them um, for not uh, actually meeting their general environmental duty because the state of knowledge within their industry, it is a certain level, um, and they are acting below that certain level. So it's much more a focus on prevention than it is after the fact. And we're really encouraged by this. And we hope that other jurisdictions really look at this shift in the EPA's responsibilities um, because then we're not cleaning up all the time. We're actually stopping this at the source again. And I guess we're all excited when we heard the United Nations Environment Assembly um, announced uh, their resolution uh, for the Global Treaty on Plastic Pollution uh, and the ambitious timeline for 2024. Um, 
My only concern around this, of course, is that it's implemented um, properly. It doesn't get watered down. Um, and I've already uh, heard today uh, an article that was published in, in the United States um, where they are trying to shift this towards a, a non-binding type, type of buy-in agreement, which is, is very concerning because we haven't even started um, you know, negotiating this and, and they're looking to water it down. It will obviously have limited um, impact. So we're very much hoping that um, this, you know, what we've all been waiting for to address plastic pollution, which is dealing with it at an international, international level, actually reaches the goals and, and the hopes that we have, um, because it is ambitious and it is a very, very tight timeline. Um, but we're hoping that all countries really, really come together on this and do what needed, needs to be really done to um, prevent and reduce marine debris, particularly plastic pollution. And I just wanted to kind of wrap up with some um, things to be considering. Um, we know that the, the term circular economy has been happening now or, or being used now for quite a while. And I, I kind of feel that it, it's starting to get that impact that sustainability had about 10 or 15 years ago that everybody uses it, but nobody really knows what it means. Um, and we've started to see this outward arrow starting to come out of the circular economy diagrams, um, which is about waste or, or loss. Um, which is kind of not what circular economy needs. So we really want to start to see this focus back on circular economy actually being a closed system. Um, and it means that you have a rainwater tank that gets made into a rainwater tank and you don't have loss in that process. So I just wanted to highlight that it's, um, you know, using these terminologies, we don't want those to be watered down either. And this is what I mean about this little waste remains arrow that started to occur in some of these circular uh, economy diagrams. So we're calling it uh, almost circular economy. Um, and this is where we really believe that greenwashing starts um, in this sector. So uh, one of the challenges are is making sure people understand what terminology means and, and words mean, and that we actually have standards associated with all of these. So this photo I've been showing for a while now in presentations and nobody still has been able to explain to me how having a 100% degradable shopping bag is actually looking after the environment. Um, most people would see the word degradable and think it was maybe the same as biodegradable or compostable or reusable, all of those able words at the end, where degradable just means it breaks up into smaller pieces faster. Um, and so we need to be really being uh, conscious on these, these terms and ensuring that standards are set around what things mean so that consumers can actually make good choices. Um, one of the programs that we have seen in Australia is called Red Cycle, where they're asking you to bring back your soft plastics um, and they make uh, things like furniture out of it, um, park benches and bollards. Um, we have concerns about this because a lot of those products are then being put out into uh, areas where there's high UV, sunlight, and big changes in temperature. Um, and you can see what starts to happen to plastic when you leave it in those type of environments. Uh, we know that a plastic bag left in the sun will disintegrate and degrade. Well, so will uh, a, a picnic bench or a bollard. Um, if it's left in those kind of UV settings as well. So we just want to be thinking about what we're making out of these recycled materials. Just because you can make something out of it doesn't mean that you actually should or that it's fit for purpose. Uh, that goes the same with rubber crumb. We are, are running a program at the moment um, in Australia where we're um, trying to quantify the amount of rubber crumb is being lost out of park surfaces and kids' playgrounds. Uh, Australia has something like 48 million tyres that we try and get rid of every year at the end of their life. And so the government decided that creating um, a shredding recycling program that um, creates them into play areas was a really good idea. Uh, we know that in tyres, um, and the rubber in the, the crumb actually has about 307 chemicals, uh, well over 200 are known carcinogenics. So not quite sure why we want to be making something that is so toxic and allowing our kids to play on it. Uh, and also, as you can see, the degradation from these surfaces can start to occur within a matter of weeks of it being laid. So it's not really fit for purpose for this either um, an economic hit for the councils and the local governments that are installing it. So we're trying to shift uh, the focus to find another solution to our tyres. And then the last one I wanted to share is this new emerging issue of ocean plastic making things. Um, now this particular product you can see is uh, a yogurt container uh, that's claiming to be made out of 100% uh, ocean plastic. 
Um, although if you ask any plastic chemist, they'll tell you that that's actually not possible uh, to make food grade uh, containers out of 100% ocean plastic. So we want to really see a focus on calling out this greenwash. The Australian um, ACCC, which is our, um, our authority that starts to look at consumer protection, is now putting a focus on um, really looking at ways of um, pushing down on unsubstantiated environmental and sustainability claims on products. And, and this is really the one that they are um, starting to look at. And when we look at what actually ocean bound plastic or ocean plastic is, it's actually only called potential ocean bound plastic by the plastics industry. And it means that it's any plastic waste that's been located within 50 kilometers of the shore. So really it may have never ended up in the ocean in the first place. So again, really putting those strong um, definitions around and standards around to make sure that the person standing in front of the yogurt fridge in the supermarket knows actually what they're investing in or when they're buying when they make their consumer choice. So we want people to be asking questions. Is it fit for purpose? Does it cause environmental or human harm? Does it follow circular economy concepts? Does it sound too good to be true? And are the claims verified or misleading? And the question that I have is if, if we can't answer, like if we answer yes to these, then, then why are we really promoting and investing it as an environmentally friendly solution um, if, if we can't answer yes to the, these things? So it's, um, it's up to us consumers uh, to drive government legislation and, and focus on manufacturing to make sure that we're not creating another headache by trying to solve um, the first one. So it is overwhelming, um, especially for those that are involved in cleanups. But you can see um, by some of these statistics about what one person can do if they can get involved with this collaboration or these kind of networks. Um, and we're so proud and so honoured to be uh, working with over 2,000 partner organisations um, uh, to have removed, you know, almost 2,000 tonnes uh, of marine debris and recorded well over 21 million data points in the database. So the biggest marine debris database in the Southern Hemisphere um, and very, very proud but it also shows how committed volunteers are to getting involved. And if you look at these volunteer hours, uh, it equates to around $24 million of in-kind support and effort from volunteers to, to deal with this issue. So the community really wanna get involved um, as well. So be a, be a, a role model, um, you know, do what you want other people to do. You, you'd be surprised at how many people watch what, what you do and, and will take your lead. So, um, you know, be that role model to help shift that change and uh, get involved in volunteering. And I, I just wanted to share some of the resources that we have on our website that people can download. Um, you know, obviously we run a program in Australia, but there's no reason uh, why people can't utilize resources that have been um, adopted or created in other places to help streamline and, and avoid duplication. So we have a lot of stuff on our website that people can download all over the place. And, and hopefully that helps with local projects as well. So a massive thank you uh, for listening uh, to my presentation today. Uh, I hope that that's given you some positiveness on what can be achieved. Uh, it is, you know, it is difficult, it is challenging, um, but there are solutions out there and in start, Instead of starting from scratch all the time, we really need to collaborate and work together um, to ensure that we're learning, you know, what really worked and more importantly, what didn't work so we don't all have to make the same mistakes right at the beginning. So thanks very much for your, your time uh, this morning and this evening. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. It's, it's really incredible to hear about all the work that's being done there. Uh, just a reminder to our, our attendees that you're welcome to submit any questions either in the Q&A box or in the chat. Um, and thank you again, Heidi. Some really interesting stories coming out there, particularly with the illegal fishing. That's an incredibly impressive story. Um, and I, I had a question regarding the um, the data capturing that you were talking about. I, I know you work a lot with citizen science, um, citizen scientists and volunteers. Um, and in your brand audits, do you kind of do a, a physical brand audit? I know you mentioned barcodes. Do you have your volunteers scanning barcodes? Yeah, right we do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now we don't necessarily want to um, collect. Um, brand data on everything because it is really quite time consuming. So we have our target species where those items that we will um, collect barcodes from all the time or, or brand information and drink bottles are an easy one for us to do. So we always try and do um, that one. And then if there's particular campaigns that people are running, um, then we can adopt uh, some of those methodologies as well for other brands if we need to or other products. 
Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's that's why I was asking because I know it can be quite an, a time intensive process. Quite a time intensive process. So to get your volunteers sort of on board for that is, is really quite quite a feat. Um, I see we have a question in the Q and A that says, um, "Thank you for an interesting talk. You commented on the unintended consequences of some solutions for plastic waste. What is Tangaroa Blue's suggestions to deal with tires and difficult to recycle plastics?" Awesome question, and um, I'm not a chemist, so um, and a lot of people say, well, if we can't do that, what we should we be doing? What what my answer to that is um, in an Australian setting is that we've got the Australian government investing hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in increasing the capacity of of tire recycling um, and rubber crumb companies. Um, let's hold back on that and let's invest some of that money into the actual proper research to find out what is the best solution without just picking the first thing that comes off, uh, off the rank that um, is, is really based on this recycle first policy that everybody seems to have. So um, I don't have the solution of what we should be doing with tyres, but um, definitely we don't want to be making it into rubber crumb because we've show, shown that that's a, um, an actually a failed um, system. So let's hold on that one and actually invest properly into finding what we should be doing with them. Uh, thanks, Heidi. Yes, and, and I agree, sort of preventing future issues from arising from a lot of the, the greenwashing examples you gave as well. Uh, I see we have another a question here that says, do you have a brand audit database um, that people could check products? Um, we have um, an opportunity for people to record um, barcodes within the database when they actually submit that into the database. We have a couple of resources that we're actually still developing and trying to bring online. They're actually um, like a PDF at the moment and they're just getting way too big in size because there's so much in there. So we are looking to translate that into um, a mobile app that you can actually uh, search through those at the, at the moment. But um, at the moment, they're just really big PDF files. Uh, thanks, Heidi. Um, and in terms of the uh, the jurisdictional gap that you spoke about earlier, do you have any suggestions for people who are looking to um, to work with sort of local municipalities and and things like that? And, and any suggestions for how how you helped resolve the issues there, where the with the sort of responsibility is shifted a bit from different departments? Yeah, I guess the best example of that one was around Operation Clean Sweep. Like when we were starting to see these companies that were um, really uh, serial offenders in, in loss of feedstock from their premises. And we, we went to the local council and kind of informed them. They were very unaware and they thought it was an EPA issue. EPA thought it was local council. So we actually just started creating these meetings where we invited everybody together to really then highlight what the issue was and let them go back into their departments to figure out who was responsible. So when we were implementing Operation Clean Sweep in Australia, not only were we spending a lot of time in engaging the industry in, in adopting best practice voluntarily, we were also working with all levels of government on the other side to really showcase the issue and identify these gaps. And, and in Victoria, it was the EPA that actually came back three years later and said, OK, we're changing our legislation. We will be um, the responsibility for this, um, for the compliance for this particular issue. So it took both sides working with industry, but also working with government. And the best place is get everybody to the table. Uh, thanks, Heidi. Um, it's still an incredibly impressive um, achievement to, to get everyone there and get sort of real change implemented there. If someone were looking to sort of uh, start their own similar initiative, I mean, as you said, and, and it's a it's a great place to be in that no one has to start from scratch. There is so much research and data available from organizations like yours that they could use as a foundation. But are there any particular areas that you would suggest people focus on that they, if they have limited resources, what specific things should they concentrate on to to have the most uh, most change for their for their investment? Yeah, look, I think um, there's a couple of things to consider. The first one is if you're trying to create an evidence base, if that's the purpose of your data is to create an evidence base so that then you can create change, you need to think about what evidence is needed. And, you know, when we first started, we just went out to a beach, we went and cleaned it, we collected everything that we, we found. And um, that's been great. We got lots and lots of data. But over the last two years, we've also created monitoring methodologies. And that's one of the resources that's available on our website. So it means that you're actually um, monitoring 
smaller sections of coastline but collecting more detailed data and doing them more regular. And through that data set, that has become um, the data set that's been more valuable for government and for actually shifting change. If you do a one-off cleanup once a year, that's great. You've removed all of that stuff from the environment, but the data only tells you what was there on that day. If you can do monthly or quarterly cleanups and monitorings where you've got transects, it's a little bit more scientifically robust. That's the data set that we've seen has the biggest impact. And it actually means that you don't have to um, you know, spend so much time counting. You need a little bit of really good data rather than a whole heap of half collected data. <laughs> Uh, I, I understand what you mean. So a little bit of data um, co collected consistently. Ooh, uh, I see there's a, another question that we have here saying, thanks Heidi, great talk. Regarding misconceptions and misuse terminology, do you find that Australians are generally well informed about terminology related to bioplastics, like compostability, biodegradation, etc.? Uh, and if not, uh, how are you addressing this? Uh, I would say no. You know, everybody does this thing that we call in Australia wish cycling. So, you know, we have a recycle bin and people go with all of their stuff that they're going to put in their recycle bin and they wish cycle. So they hope that it's recyclable. They think it might be. So we have this term called recycling. So there's a lot of that in Australia. Um, how, we, how are we trying to address that is through education and awareness campaigns. So we need to work with government to get um, specific definitions around some of this stuff. And then we need to educate the public as to what that all means. Now, one of the really interesting things that is currently happening in Australia is um, shift a lot of single use plastic bans and, and they're done at a state level. And of course the shift is to uh, compostables. That's been what everyone's been talking about. But just recently, there's been some interesting research come out of Scotland that's been looking at the amount of PFAS, so the forever chemicals, that are actually in compostable um, uh, food packaging. And that's because um, they, need to, they need to manage heat. So, you know, if you go and get a paper coffee cup, obviously it's not gonna hold it if it's just paper. So they have to line it with something and they, um, PFAS has been one of those chemicals. So um, all these people think they were doing the right thing by taking compostables and shifting from single-use plastics, but this is another example of finding that wasn't actually as good as it could be, and we should really be shifting back to um, reusables to start off with. Um, it doesn't matter what the single-use product is, it's going to have an impact if it's single-use, um, and we need to start shifting back to reusables. So I, I think that that discussion and that narrative is starting to happen in Australia, um, but we all want to just believe what we're told. If it's easy, convenient and cheap, we'll go with it, regardless of whether it's accurate or not. And we just need to make sure that that accurate information is getting out there. So that's our, one of our big missions. Uh, very, very good points. And, and that's often sort of such an issue with greenwashing is that it, you kind of have to be aware of how much uh, burden of research, research you're putting on consumers to kind of research their coffee cup and what all the chemicals are involved. And a lot of the times that information won't be available on the item itself. So it's, it's quite tricky and you know, you need the appropriate people to be doing that kind of research before it goes to market. Um, all right, I, I don't see any other questions at the moment, but if anyone does have any questions after today's session or watching the recording, uh, please feel free to email us and we can pass those along. For now, I think we can end off today's session here. Um, thank you all, everyone who attended today, and particularly thank you, Heidi. Um, we really, really appreciate you taking the time, um, despite the time differences and despite uh, a busy schedule. We really appreciate um, you taking the time to share to share the story of Tangaroa Blue with us today. Um, thank you so much. Uh, no, th thank you. Thank you again, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon um, or evening, um, and thank you again, Heidi. Thanks, everyone.